And so if, if we don't know what the situation afterwards would look like, how you can possibly compare with the situation now? It is, it's an inherently impossible task. I think that the truth is quite clear from an economic standpoint that we've had enormous benefits from being in the EU. You can never say what we would have had without it, but I think we've had enormous benefits. I think the problem and the sort of sleight of hand that politicians are now being caught out on is we've tended to talk about how we like the single market and we just don't like the bureaucracy and Britain's always been in favour of the single market and we have benefited from that. But the single market is the free movement of people, which we're finding actually can be quite difficult politically, is the free movement of goods but that requires a single set of rules to have a single market and often it's those rules that people don't like and consider to be EU bureaucracy. And if we also talk and free movement of capital, we sort of like, but then we worry about the city. And I think this, at the heart, I mean, the awkward thing, the reason why these arguments about Europe, I think, have become very difficult for supporters of our membership of the EU, is that actually we're not sure if we're in favour of this stuff anymore, the stuff that was at the core of our argument for well, membership. I I'm in favour of it. I mean, these four freedoms that Stephanie has spoken about are, have enriched our economy and enriched our society. And I, I make no apology for being in favour of free movement of people. Um, it's it, free movement of people, the people who've come to Britain, we've got about 2.3 million of them from the rest of the EU. They tend to be young, hardworking, they pay their taxes, they arrive at a time when they've already mostly been educated at their own home country, so we're not paying for their education. And they're not normally so old that they're a burden on the National Health Service. So that's the economic advantage of them. On top of that, I think there is a cultural enrichment that we have from having all of these nationalities coming to London. And there's also the freedom that our people have to go and work and live across the channel. Don't forget there are 2.2 million, almost as many Brits, mm. living, about a million of them in Spain, actually. And so the free movement, it's great. It's the, this, the Treaty of Rome that set off the European Union is probably one of the biggest so charters for freedom that the world has ever seen. What would a successful renegotiation look like? A successful renegotiation, now I suspect it's actually not possible because the kind of things that we would want, like proper controls over our borders, the freedom to say no to people coming in, we're probably not going to be given that. Um, we only have the support when it comes to tackling things like benefit tourism of Holland and Germany. So the idea that we'll be able to get that kind of constituency for change, I doubt. Stephanie is absolutely right when it comes to talking about leaving the EU. We're talking about hypotheticals here. But there are certain economic facts that suggest to me that outside we can still flourish. Still the sixth largest economy in the world. Still only 10% of our GDP depends upon Europe. They still sell far more to us than we sell to them. And according to the Lisbon Treaty, if we leave, they are compelled to negotiate a new free trade agreement. And it's very interesting that Norway and Switzerland, which are both outside of the EU, actually trade more uh, per capita with the EU than we do. So I think there are, there are certain fundamental economic They're facts about that position. very small countries. Small countries they trade are very small. more than big countries oh, as a proportion of their GDP. That's just a sort of... Uh, a, you know, a statistical quirk that you've mentioned there. I mean, I mean, a serious the problem, free the trade problem, agreement would actually involve uh, having to comply by a lot of the same rules. So I thought would. a lot of people yeah. on your side the tend more to say, access, no, no, we need to be out no, completely. You're absolutely right. And one argument that Eurosceptics, I, I do think, are very dubious on is the idea that if we left, all regulations would disappear. We'd sign up to a lot of those because we'd have to, to go on trading. But nonetheless, China manages to do business. America manages to do business. What's the largest investor in, in Britain right now? It's not the EU, it's America. So the idea that stepping outside of it means that all those jobs will disappear, no, those mm. jobs aren't dependent on a membership of the EU. They're dependent on continued jobs, trade with Americans Europe, invest and we will in keep Britain. that. A lot of those American companies invest in Britain because we can give them access to the whole single market with 500 million people. And this idea that we could be like the Swiss, I mean, it just isn't a good argument. Take the city. The city, you may not like the city, but it is 10% <laughs> of our economy, financial services. If we were like Switzerland, we would not have a passport, a financial, the, the, we have an our passport, our, our firms in the city, they can offer services right across the EU. Yeah. If we were like Switzerland, they couldn't. The Swiss, they have wanted a passport for their banks for years, and the EU has denied it. Yeah, and if, we cut ourselves, EU, if we cut ourselves off and 11 from the countries city, in the EU we will then be putting to our put a financial transaction, transaction tax on us, which would only 10 the now. City. One of them dropped out a couple okay, of weeks my ago. My apologies. Ten countries are now trying to do that. So if that happens, that will affect our competitiveness, won't it? Not much, actually, because what that, that financial transaction tax, I'm, I'm very much against it, but it has been diluted as every month has gone by. Not only has it fallen from 11 till 10, it has been confined now to shares and some other derivatives 
and it basically looks a bit like our own stamp duty, but right. it will be a much lower but rate. So I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's going to probably be a bit it's of a damp square. I'm, I'm more or less on your side on this, mm. Hugo, but I, I think maybe... But surely you have to accept that it's much harder to make these arguments now. It sounds more like an elitist argument. It's wonderful being in London and having lots of nationalities. Uh, the city is very good for large parts of uh, the South East and well, also parts the of the UK. But, it's not, but, I did, but I think it has become a much more respectable, it's intellectually, not, argument to be outside. And we can't, you can't deny that. But we it's have not to just the city. I mean, we, can talk about, we can talk about the car industry. It depends, of course, how much damage we suffer depends on how we come out and what sort of arrangement it is. But some people, like Nigel Lawson, want us to be, just rely on our membership of the World Trade Organization. If we were part of the World Trade Organization, there would then be tariffs on exports. That means there would be taxes on all yeah. cars that we export yeah, but, uh, to but the EU. Can, can I just say that? And those taxes are, would be 10%. So if, I mean, I'm not saying that that's the only scenario, but that's what a credible Eurosceptic Nigel okay. Lawson is arguing for. All right, I'm going to have to